tell you today a little bit about something that we do in my lab. I'm a professor at the National University of Singapore. I'm a neuroscientist by training, and what I work in is to try to understand how the brain works. Normally, we, uh, the main line of research in my lab is related to understanding what makes humans and other animals intelligent, and we look at this at the level of neural networks in the brains. Uh, the thing I will tell you about today is something that we um, leverage this knowledge to kind of apply uh, for brain-machine interface, and I'll give you a very light paintbrush of the types of things that we'll be doing uh, probably for the next, hopefully, hundreds of years in this area. Uh, at least my best guess I'll try to give you. So first of all, what is a brain-machine interface? It's any technology that enables, enables the communication between the brain and the machine. Brain, broadly defined. Machine, broadly defined. I'll give you some examples of machines. Uh, okay, so before we go into any boring technical detail, I'll tell you, I will use Hollywood to help me with imagination here. So what kind of things can we do with brain-machine interface? All right, so most of the work that is done around the world today is related to restoring lost functions. So if you become blind or you lose your uh, sense of hearing or you get a spinal cord injury or something like that, you're losing something, whether it's a sense or the capacity to move. So because today most of this research is funded by biomedical research companies or government, uh, this is the main focus today. What do we want to achieve? So this is someone, let me, okay, so this is a movie called Robocop, in case you haven't seen it. Uh, this person lost his hand, so he's an amputee. You cannot hear. He's playing the guitar. Um, anyway, so there is some fancy brain measuring technology in the background here, and he's able to move his robotic hand in a way that basically is useful for his life, right? So in this case, he can play the guitar, and it's very touching. Uh, anyway, so this is something that we're not too far away from, and this is, I'll show you where we're at. Uh, but why stop there? Why stop with what evolution or God gave us? We don't need to only have two arms and two legs. Maybe we should increase our capabilities. So this is an example from Spider-Man. This is Dr. Octopus that has, in addition to his two arms and two legs, he added an additional four limbs, because why not? Our brains are big enough to do this kind of thing. So that's fine. We could also imagine other scenarios where uh, we can perhaps control remotely robots uh, in a way that, in a two-way interaction, so what is called a, a closed-loop brain-machine interface, where you get sensory input, in this case vision, touch, and you can also control. The things that I'm showing you now, and this is another example from the Matrix, where it's the same as Avatar, except that instead of controlling a, a robot in real world, you can control it in a virtual world. And the principle underlying all of this that I'm showing you is the very same, which is ways to uh, interact with your brain, inject information, in this case from the senses, and at the same time control something in the world. So we do this all the time. We have an ongoing brain-machine interface right now, which is interfacing with our bodies. Our eyes are sending information to our brains. We are moving our muscles, which are robots, right? I mean, robotic devices, in a sense. Nothing much more smart about a muscle than about an actuator in a, in a robot. So. And, and the, the examples I'm giving now are all kind of like the lowest level examples. We're dealing with sensory and motor systems. These are, these are useful because they're easy to observe, easy to empathize with. I will not tell you anything about the other things, but you know, most of what our brain does is not about sensory and motor control. It's about thinking and about uh, experiencing pain and pleasure and memories and all of this. All of this is fair game for brain-machine interface and eventually we'll get there. My guess, within the next 100 years, we should get here. Uh, but what are we doing today? Okay, so as I mentioned, we need to measure brain activity, and in the time I have, unfortunately, I think I will only be able to talk about different methods that we have today to measure brain activity. And uh, if I have some time left, I will tell you briefly about methods to manipulate brain activity. Okay, so normally when we're talking about the brain, 
what we want to do is extract information from it, right? We want to know what you are trying to do or what you are perceiving. And the brain is a structure that is uh, localized. So different parts of the brain are processing different types of information. So when we are thinking about extracting information, we want to optimize two different types of resolution. In the y-axis here is the temporal resolution. If you are uh, acquiring data very fast, that's good, because our brain works at a millisecond scale. Your thoughts, your movements, these are all generated within tens of milliseconds. So that's the time resolution that we want. In space, we want to be able to have a good spatial resolution because two adjacent parts of the brain may be doing very different things. So we want to know where the activity that you're measuring is coming from. So in this plot, if you are along this side of the plot, you will be very good. Good temporal and good spatial information and less information on this other side. So this is all that we have today to measure brain activity. Okay, maybe not all, and leaving a few out, but these are the main methods that we have today. In green here are the non-invasive methods, meaning that we don't have to cut skin to, uh, or cut anything to measure brain activity. And in red are the ones that you have to put things inside your body to measure brain activity. Of course, we would want to not have to cut anyone to do this, so the first, most of the work is done on this area. But unfortunately, you can see, this are the, is the quadrant that has the least information. If we wanted to have the best information, that would mean going to individual cells, because we're assuming that the, and there are good reasons to assume that individual cells are the ones that are conveying most of the information. And for that, we need to insert needles in the brain. And I'll show you a little bit about that. But first, let's see about non-invasive techniques, what we can do with it. And everything I will tell you about today is related to controlling like the robotic hand in the first bit. If we wanted to do that, I will tell you that these techniques are not good enough. For other things, they may be good enough, but not for this, okay? So let's say EEG. So the EEG, in case uh, you're not familiar with this, it's, it's a very simple technique, very old. It just involves putting an electrode in the head, uh, on top of the skin, and measuring electric fields that are produced by the brain. And the analogy that sometimes people give is something along these lines. If individual neurons in your brain are people in a stadium that are watching a football match, your EEG would be similar to a microphone that is a kilometer away. So you will be able to hear the people talking, but you won't know that Bob is very hungry and he wants a hot dog. And, but once in a while, someone will score. And then this guy will be like, okay, something happened. So, what EEG is measuring is this kind of activity. It's the synchronization of millions of neurons in the brain. And whenever this happens, you see certain uh, oscillatory frequencies with high power, and you say, okay, something happened in the brain, and you try to interpret that. But we may be missing a lot of information, right? We, we're missing all of the things that these people are saying. Okay, so this is an example of, it's a bit old now, but I'll, I'll show you uh, newer results. So this is an EEG cap. It is a Japanese group uh, a few years back. And what he's trying to do here, he's giving an instruction. It says right hand there. So now this person in the cap starts thinking, right hand, right hand, right hand. He's trying to control the robot's right hand. He's still thinking, by the way. Now the computer is collecting all this noisy EEG data. And he's still thinking. He's still thinking. All right. Eventually he will get it. All right, there we go. Now he got it, the information had enough, uh, there was enough information there for the decoding algorithm to decide, okay, I can say he was right and not left. This is the simplest possible way of decoding something. You have two alternatives, one has to be the case, you're trying to decide which of the two is the case. So you can see that even though this was a big, um, it, it was important at the time, it just, it won't, it's not practical, right? You cannot be waiting 10 seconds to do something. So uh, this is a bit of a busy slide, but never mind. This is a meta-analysis done this year. And looking at all the studies that have used EEG to control lower limb control, so to allow patients with tetraplegia or some form of spinal cord injury to be able to walk again with an exoskeleton. Because it's a simple control, right? You, all you have to do is say, move, don't move and that's all these patients need. 
But unfortunately, in a, in a rating measure that they have, all of these methods, all of these papers, using the most sophisticated methods that you can imagine, they just don't do very well. So in conclusion today, we can say that EEG-based systems, as of last week, cannot be used for real-time control. And we have good reason to believe that this will stay like this forever. We need to find a different method. So you will see once in a while, uh, by the way, I, I, I Googled this morning, because I, I, I give this talk regularly, and I was like, OK, maybe something new came up. I don't know. So I found this. It's a, I will not show you the video. It's kind of like but it's a emotive insight, which is a one electrode or a few electrodes EEG system that controls the movement of this Tesla back and forth. Anyway, uh, I think given what we know about this technology, I, I don't know anything about this implementation in particular, but there is a lot of... Uh, you have to be careful when you see these kind of things. Don't... By, by looking at this, most people would think, ah, okay, so we're moving towards a situation where I don't need to use my hands, just think, and the car will move. No, sorry, that's not going to happen with this technology. At least I don't think so. Okay, so I will quickly go over some of the other commonly used techniques. Functional magnetic resonance imaging. This is a technique that is very popular now in cognitive neuroscience. It's a technique that allows you to measure blood oxygenation in the brain, in local uh, parts of the brain. So what happens here is that whenever your brain is active, you're thinking of going to eat McDonald's or getting a cup of coffee somewhere here. Um, and then the part of the brain that is involved in, the, in that thought process uses oxygen. Activity of the brain uses oxygen. So our brain is smart, blood flow increases to that area, and blood flow, blood flow is a bit slow. This is the time course of a blood change, uh, oxygenation level change. So you can see for a small, very brief stimulus, even like a 10 millisecond stimulus, you will see a 10, 15 second change in blood flow. So you can already get a sense that the temporal resolution will not be too great with this. Let's see what's the state of the art on brain machine interface with fMRI. So he, he stretched the hand here, thinking, thinking a bit better than with EEG, but okay, he got it. So EEG gives you very good temporal resolution, really crappy spatial resolution. fMRI gives you good spatial resolution, but very crappy temporal resolution. So both of these are not very good for these and probably will never be used for a sensible brain machine interface. Okay, as of, I wasn't going to talk about this, uh, but this morning again, I went online and I realized that all of Twitter, at least in my Twitter feed, it was going super excited about this new MEG system that was just developed. So MEG is, a, is similar in a sense to um, EEG, except that instead of measuring electrical fields, it measures magnetic fields. And normally, e, uh, MEG is, um, it's also a bulky machine, I'll show you here. So that's the MEG machine that you can find in a hospital today. So you can imagine that you kind of walk around with a brain machine interface with that. But researchers developed this portable MEG that apparently is super awesome, signal to noise ratio is excellent, and you can localize at millisecond accuracy in, in a relatively good uh, spatial resolution. So uh, anyway, I, I know very little about this. It just came out last week. It's entirely possible that it will not go anywhere, but it's also possible that it will be a revolutionary technique, and in a few years we'll see this everywhere. Uh, anyway, it, this is a field that is moving quite fast, and there are lots of different uh, groups around the world working on new methods to, to, uh, to measure brain activity and to manipulate it. All right, so since we already explored the non-invasive ones, and none of them really work, let's go to the golden child, especially the one in my lab. We measure brain activity using electrodes that are implanted in the brain, and we measure single unit activity, single neuron activity. This is normally done in monkeys, rats, and humans. So in my lab, I normally use monkeys. I'll show you a little bit about that. The first one that I will show you about is, a, is an experiment that was published last year, and, and the goal of this was to provide people with spinal cord injury or with ALS or anyone that kind of move around, provide them with the capacity to uh, move a wheelchair just by thinking about it. Uh, so initially what we did was train a monkey to control a joystick and move this platform around and 
chase a, a trainer that was holding a piece of apple and they were just following the apple, basically. Then once they were trained, we implanted these arrays of electrodes in the primary motor cortex. This is a part of the brain that directly controls the movement of your arm. So we are listening to what the cells are saying if they wanted to move the arm. And these are, this is the array, so it's a, a few hundred of these little needles are put into the brain. So this is zoomed into one of the tips of one of those electrodes. So these are metal electrodes that are completely insulated except for the tip. So we're measuring electric fields just around the tip in, the, in a few microns around. And if we're lucky enough, so this is an electrode, this is one neuron, we put them blindly, so we just put them in and hope for the best. If it falls near a neuron, we will be able to measure single neuron activity. And this is, uh, in a second I'll show you how it looks like. So this is the setup, the monkey is sitting in the chair, he has a joystick here, the robotic platform, these are amplifiers. So uh, at the moment there is no, uh, the, the technology is not available to implant everything under the skin and just allow the patients to walk around in their lives. At the moment, and I will show you what, what we have, everything is external. So we have external amplifiers, external um, wireless transmission and all this. Now in ASTAR, in NUS, and in many other parts in Europe and in the US, lots of groups are working to miniaturize everything, putting it all under the skin, and then just releasing the people into the wild. So this is, uh, these are like, each one of these little boxes is the signal from one of these little wires inside the brain. You, it's hard to see, but a lot of these have these little deviations. Those are individual action potentials from one neuron. So this is a zoom in into one of these here. Each one of these yellow lines is one action potential. So as the monkey is moving around, you will see certain cells that will become active. So say when the monkey wants to move to the right, certain cells have selectivity to the right, so they will become active, and so on. We know that it's there because you cannot do any movement in your life without activating your brain. Everything we do has to be, it starts in the brain. So we know that the information is there, we just need to extract it. Now, um, we are collecting hundreds of neurons simultaneously, and this means that we have a hundred dimensional matrix that we need to decode. So we need to use some dimensionality reduction techniques like PCA, and then we can just use linear decoders to, uh, to the, uh, basically determine in real time what the monkey is trying to do. So I'll skip all the development. It took a while, but eventually the monkey learns how to use it. So now we remove the joystick. So you can see there is no joystick there. He's just sitting there with his hands. We're measuring the brain, that, the part of the brain that controls this arm, but his arm is quite still, and he can still uh, control the robotic platform almost as well as, a, as if he was controlling it with a joystick. So this is already at a stage, at least in the monkeys, where we can reach a point, if we were able to implant everything, they could use it. I mean, it would, it would be just as good as if they had an arm. This is another example from a different group, this one in the US. Uh, this time, it's the same technique, everything is identical, except that instead of moving the robotic platform, they're moving a robotic arm to fit themselves. So now you can see this is a, an intact monkey, so he has the two arms, they're just in those tubes. And the monkey is, so in this sense, this is approaching a little bit like Dr. Octopus in the second video. He has his two normal arms, but he can also control a third arm. Uh, this one is a bit harder for him because it's 3D motion, so it's, it's a bit tougher. They have also tried this in humans, so I'll show you. Unfortunately, in humans, we, so in monkeys, we can work with them every day, and they get really good at understanding how to control the brain-machine interface. Humans come into the lab maybe once or twice a week. They work for an hour, then they get tired, and they go home. So they, they so far, they are not as good as the monkeys control this. So you can see here she's trying to, she, she also has the electrodes, so they're implanted in the brain, this is the amplifier, and now she's trying to control this. You can see, she, eventually she will do it, but it's, it's a bit clumsier than with the monkeys. Um, so at the moment, today in Singapore, we are uh, in collaboration with engineers and National Neuroscience Institute, where they have patients with that are willing to go through these kind of trials, we're trying to uh, export this technology to, to patients, basically, and whatever they want. If they want communication, movement, we're kind of like tailoring to their likes. 
Okay, I'll skip this, but eventually she gets it. Okay, there she goes. Okay, so I mentioned also that uh, our arms and muscles are part of, are kind of like a robotic device because, you know, they're physical systems that we're moving with our brains. So what happens if you're not an amputee but you just don't have the capacity to move your arms, say if you have nerve damage? It happens a lot in Southeast Asia, especially in countries where a lot of people go in their bikes. They fall, they hit their shoulders, and all their nerves are cut, and they're left with an arm they cannot feel with, they cannot move. So, to try to fix this, uh, which so in this case, this uh, again in monkeys, it was a reversible inactivation. So you inject an anesthetic into the arm, and it kind of the nerve stops working. So uh, the monkey here is trying to play basketball, grab a ball here and put it in here. He cannot because his arm is too weak. Now with FBS on, where they were recording brain activity from the same part of the brain, and instead of controlling a robotic arm, they're stimulating directly into the arm into the muscles. So you can evoke a specific movement that you want to achieve and now he can play his basketball. Now this has been tried uh, last a couple of years ago in humans, so again, not as nice. But um, anyway, so this is without any help. So this is a patient with spinal cord injury. He can still move a little bit, but he's quite weak. So he can, he's trying to turn, pick up the bottle and turn it into the container, and he cannot. Um, oh yeah, okay. Anyway, he will be able to do it later on, let me skip this. Uh, okay, so I will leave it at that for methods to measure brain activity. Again, we're just scratching the surface. The second part that we, I will not talk about is how to manipulate. We can also inject activity into the brain uh, by using the same electrodes in this case, or non-invasive techniques, each one also has its shortcomings. Uh, and I don't know if you have seen this before, last video, I promise. Um, this is uh, an application of uh, stimulation, which is called deep brain stimulation. It's been, a, uh, in this case, it's a Parkinson patient that has tremor. So this is without the stimulation. This is stimulation in the basal ganglia, which is a part that is failing. So this is with stimulation. So you can see, for motor symptoms, it's quite striking. The same thing has been applied for depression, for uh, chronic pain for whatever. I mean, every, they are trying everything now, stimulating everything in the brain, seeing what they can fix. But the, the main idea is the same. You're just activating parts of the brain that are, would naturally not be activated with these electrodes. And I will leave it at that. These are some of the institutes in Singapore that are working on this. And we'll take any questions if we have time. Okay, one question. Yes. Um, are there sort of open source communities online um, hacking on this? Lots, but uh, it's mostly on the non-invasive stuff. And it's um, primarily, there is a little bit on brain machine interface for, for control. But as I, as I showed you, it's, it's a tricky area to be in because the signals that you're dealing with are very noisy. Uh, you, there have been certain applications like rehab for uh, motor, motor rehab or maybe to help people, uh, kids with ADHD to concentrate and things like this. But it's not like straightforward. And then on the other side, there is a, a huge community online, a scarily large community that is involved in uh, stimulating the brain. And, and that's a bit tricky because we don't know what are the long-term effects of this kind of thing. You're actively manipulating something that we don't really know how it works. So we actively discourage this type of thing, although some of these techniques are also used in the lab. Even when they're used in the lab, they're used with extreme precaution. Um, are there any Google keywords that you can give us or communities that you can find us to? So for the stimulation, the main technique that is used, and the, I guess the keyword that you can use, is direct transcranial stimulation. Direct current transcranial, transcranial stimulation. Uh, there are a few companies that are working on EEG-based systems for controlling, say, video games or things like that, like Emotive is one. But I'm sure there are plenty of others I'm not familiar. But yeah, it's a, it's a very simple, simple technology in a sense. The, the hard part is cleaning the data. So, 
there is also, river for round time, so... There is also open PCI community, which is quite big, and they do measurement part a lot. So <coughs> you can 3D print them. Open PCI, brain, brain computer interface. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much.